Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today it's my pleasure to have Victor Segalowski with us. Victor is the co-founder and CEO of Lightwater Scientific, the first and only super deuterium depleted light water, where he has dedicated himself to the research, development, and production of this rare water. Victor has researched and studied the benefits of deuterium depleted water through his theory entitled Endogenous Radiation Damage Theory of Aging. It proposes that our biggest obstacle to longevity is the excess deuterium and other damaging isotopes on the planet and proper mitigation will radically extend our lifespans. Victor started his career as an innovator in plant-based culinary art, having co-founded the first organic gourmet raw food restaurant in North America called Raw. He attended Loyola University and the University of Hawaii where he pursued multidisciplinary education. He's completed apprenticeships in uh, graduate coursework in chemistry, optical microscopy, and molecular biology. He's the author of many articles and guides in the field of wellness, biohacking, emerging medicine, technology, mysticism, and esoteric wisdom. Outside of the water category, Victor is the author of Gold, Catalyst of Radiant Health, a book about the history and science of the medical benefits of gold, and is adept in gold alchemy and the making of ORMEs. Victor, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So I'd, I'd love to, first of all, hear your origin story of how you got into deuterium depleted water, because that's not even something most people know about. Uh, and in fact, I, as a biohacker, didn't understand the benefits of it, really even know what that meant, deuterium depleted water, until just last year. Uh, at, at one of the biohacking conferences, it was the biohacking Congress. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I bought some of your light water and, uh, have, have, uh, enjoyed it and just wanted to hear your origin story for our listener to understand how this became such a thing for you, such a passion. Of course. Well, from a young age, I was interested in, uh, gerontology. I was in the, in aging. You know, when I was a kid, I would, it was very fascinating to me, you know, how the whole life cycle of, of humans, you know, we're, we're born, we age, we die. So I was always kind of keen on investigating things. And there's just not much out there on on aging. So uh, about uh, now, I opened that raw food restaurant in uh, 1990, end of 94. So uh, that got me, in, that got me that opened me up to a whole new world of how to see the world, you know, not just through the lens that I grew up with, but through a more inquisitive lens based on new information. So I was very keen on new information comes in. I try to assimilate it, understand it and apply it and use it myself. So in 2004, I read an article called in search of the fountain of youth. And this, this was quite interesting because it talked about, uh, the, the work that they did in the late 50s in the Soviet Union uh, around deuterium depleted water. And it was, what was fascinating to me is they found this population, two populations of people that had extended longevity. They had, they had longer lifespan, longer health span. I think it was, uh, I think it was like uh, 520 uh, centenarians per, per million versus just, uh, which is like 15 to 20 everywhere else. These were populations living in Siberia, essentially like Eskimo type conditions. And, and these scientists, young gerontologists, actual gerontologists and biophysicists were trying to figure out why these people were living so much longer statistically compared to everybody else in Europe. And it took them a few years to figure it out. But what they honed in on was the water they were drinking. They looked at, they looked at the food, they looked at, you know, all kinds of habits that they had. And then they started looking at this glacial meltwater they were drinking, and they found that it had 16% lower deuterium levels in it than everybody else. So this really set it off. This was 1959. And it was not, a, it was only 1932 that it was this, that deuterium was discovered as an isotope of hydrogen in the first place. So this was relatively fresh and in a very important discovery. So I really keen, uh, I really focused in on that. Uh, and, and, Obviously, since the late 50s, uh, there's been a lot of uh, research studies and things like that. But after they made this, this discovery, uh, before they published, they did a great number of uh, 
studies and tests on everything from lower life forms all the way up to mammals to show that when you reduce deuterium, you increase your metabolism, you increase your mitochondrial health, you increase your potential lifespan and health span. And when you add deuterium, it's the opposite. So I thought this was very interesting. And this got me interested in the science of deuterium, which is quite simple because all it is is just a version of hydrogen called an isotope. And this particular version of hydrogen, of which there is very little, 0.012% of all hydrogen, uh, it, the, only, the only difference is, hi, why do we, the question is, why do we use hydrogen in our bodies for all our, for all our biological processes? Why do rocket ships use it? Why do stars use it? Well, there's a simple reason, so simple and elegant reason, because hydrogen is the only element on the periodic table that does not have a neutron. One proton, one electron. It's simple, right? So deuterium is that hydrogen, but it has a neutron. So it's one proton, one neutron, one electron, which makes it double the mass of a normal hydrogen. And so this is where the biological problem starts. So we have a mechanical problem in our biology where enzymes, uh, nano, now confined space, spaces, compartments inside our mitochondria, electron transport chains, all kinds of all kinds of recycling mechanisms in our body, all kinds of energy production pathways, ATP especially producing pathways, they rely on the simple form of hydrogen. And when you introduce to it a, a more complex form, which is deuterium, it doesn't fit. It's like a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't quite fit. Processes have evolved in our bodies to manage this biologically. But over the last 100,000 years or so, we've been our deuterium levels on the planet have been creeping up. So we've been compromised more by this. So I thought this was really fascinating. And uh, now it, this is not what I originally learned in 2004, but this this started that started me on a journey because I like these upstream types of solutions that are foundational. Like what can I do at the foundational level that will keep me from putting all these Band-Aids on downstream? Right, all the supplements, the pills, the, the, the whatever, whatever, whatever it is, the the, the uh, changing your diet, all this. So I was very interested in getting to the root cause of things. I mean, my my primary interest is getting to the root cause of aging, and even if you can get to it and understand it, doesn't mean you can affect it. But it, that's that that was what drives me and what interests me. Uh, now, at first, I was driven by getting myself well because I wasn't I wasn't quite I wasn't quite optimally healthy either. So once I did that, I felt like, okay, I can, I can, I can, you know, keep going. I think I, I think I, I think I have a little piece of this puzzle, you know, and not only is it a little piece, I think it's, if not, it, it may be, I mean, my, I will contend that it's probably the greatest discovery in biology of our time, because it's such a small, tiny intervention that a person can do in their lives that will change everything. So it's all about energy at the end of the day. And it's all about the net energy benefit that we have as we grow older. The problem is, as we grow older, we have the opposite of net energy benefit. We have net energy, net energy deficit. So how do we, how do we continue to age, but still remain at the same energy, net energy benefit that we had when we were, when we were younger? This is what fascinates me. And this is what I like to share with people, because I think we have found one of these key missing links, and that is the reduction of deuterium in your body. So you, in, in your introduction, you mentioned the water. The water is simply deuterium depleted water. But the, the, the miracle and the magic is when you reduce the deuterium in your own body. Water helps achieve that. There's other ways to stimulate that, to accelerate that. But that's the primary way. So, but there's, um, there's heavy water in everything, right? There's, uh, there's yeah, deuterium, it's in not just in the water we drink, but in the food we that eat. Food. That's right. It's everywhere. So how do you get, a, how, how do you get away from this? It is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And the, the ocean is 155.76. Uh, most drinking water is 150. In certain places, you do get lucky. You have places that are reduced, like that place in Siberia or a lot of places in the U.S. Usually, it depends on the hydrological cycle. So usually you'll find water that has uh, less deuterium, like tap water, somewhere 
in the mountains, like on the eastern slope of the, of the Rockies, it's fantastic. You have water coming out of your tap. That's 139 parts per million in many places. Uh, there's, it is, it is in the diet. Now consider that a hundred years ago, we never had hydrogenated oils. We never had these types of preservatives that we use now. So we never really concentrated food the way we do now. So this introduces even more deuterium into the system. So the ideal level for a human body is in the 120 ppm range. We know that because, well, we know that through the new science of deuteronomics, which endeavors to explain how deuterium is managed by the body. And we also know that when we look at the water that's inside our cells, specifically inside the mitochondria, and this is water that's synthesized de novo. It's not water that we drink. Nothing that we drink actually makes it to the uh, inner confined nanospaces of our biology inside the mitochondria, inside the mitochondrial matrix. That's, that water is known as metabolic water, and that water is already 60 to 70 percent reduced in deuterium. So your body is doing its best effort to keep it down through the different, the different exchange, hydrogen exchange mechanisms that are happening at the biological level uh, in the Krebs cycle and, and other places. So we can manage to keep it down. Uh, people can do this successfully even without drinking deuterium depleted water, but it helps. But in that, but in, but in that, in that instance, you have to kind of have a different lifestyle or change the lifestyle you have and people limit their deuterium through uh, eating less, uh, more fat-based foods, more ketogenic foods, because they have less deuterium. Fat has a lot less deuterium than carbohydrates. That's nature's strategy is to load up the carbs and to deplete the fats the other ways. So the simple things that we knew historically, the humans have done, they've, eat, they've eaten less, they fasted, they've eaten more fat-based diets, they've, they've they consume spring water from mountains, or at least that they can. So we have a natural system for managing this deuterium. Unfortunately, in our, on, top of, on top of these levels rising since the, since the end of the Ice Age and even before, we've, we've a exacerbated it through our modern lifestyle and diet. So the key here is just to, go, is just to get 15 to 20% lower than what we are now. And that's our insurance policy. For, for a long, happy, fruitful, and disease-free life. Now, if you go lower, then you, start to, then you start to get into, like, how can you increase human performance at the athletic level and whatnot? We have, when we, when we think about water, we think of water as H2O, right? And, mm -hmm. but not all waters, but water is not H2O. <laughs> There's a lot of different variations, combinations of isotopes of the oxygen and the hydrogen and the one we want to focus on here is called hdo and that d is deuterium so a very small amount of h2o in a glass of water is hdo roughly about six drops for uh, per every liter so it's not very much you know we have about five four to five grams of this deuterium in our bodies but when you look at how much of it is in the bodies that becomes very significant because it's four to five times more than the basic constituents that we need for life. You know, glucose, potassium, magnesium, et cetera, et cetera. Essential elements and nutrients. So we are overrun by this stuff because of this cumulative effect of putting into our bodies. So what I was saying is the, the, the water that we have inside of our cells in the mitochondria is already deuterium depleted. And our goal is to keep it deuterium depleted. Or to keep, and so we do that by, by measuring the water that's in our extracellular, our extracellular water. And if that water is in the 120 to 130 ppm range, that's a, that's a very important insurance policy for our longevity. Now, if you are drinking purely deuterium depleted water, that's going to set you back monetarily quite a bit because uh, it's an expensive process to remove deuterium uh, correct, water correct, from, correct. from the rest of the water. Getting those six drops out of the liter is yeah. very expensive. And so you can I, spend quite a fortune with the amount of water that you need to take in on a daily basis. Yeah, that's uh, a yes. That's, that, that's a yes and no. That's a yes and no. And it's a yes okay. because if you because you if you drink pure deuterium depleted water we make we take out 
94 to 97% of the deuterium in water. But what you, people do is they mix it, they dilute it. So if your regular drinking water is 100, is regular, our reverse osmosis or tap water or spring water, it's going to be about 150 ppm. Could be a little less. But when you dilute 10 ppm with 150 ppm water, even if you dilute it four times, four to one, you still get a water that's 122 ppm. And that tends to be a lot less expensive because then you could, you could, you could maintain your deuterium level to be in the 120s for about five bucks, five bucks a liter when you do that type of math. Now, certainly some people are going to want to drink it at a lower dilution. So uh, one to one will give you 80 parts per million. One to two will give you 100 ppm. One to three will give you 112 ppm. So there's a, there is a there is a long term strategy here, but if you wanna if you want it to be cost effective, you have to dilute. It still works because you're because because that a significant delta over time is five even five or ten percent is a significant delta of difference over in terms of the the amount of meta, metabolic uh, health that it gives you or metabolic energy that you get from from uh, depleting your deuterium levels just to, just even by five or ten percent over over time so this is a, this is a this is a long-term strategy but there are you can clearly there are some short-term benefits which i talk about in my lectures but but uh, uh, the long-term benefit is just to slightly reduce your deuterium level by 15 to 20 percent Okay, so in the bigger scheme of things, of all the different biohacks that someone could partake, uh, they could take different kinds of supplements like um, true niogen, which boosts um, NAD uh, levels, uh, spermidine, there's brain octane, which is uh, an MCT oil from Bulletproof that's uh, uh, C8 carbon 8 specifically. Um, and uh, that's good for the brain. Unfair advantage also from Bulletproof, which is good for the, the mitochondria. There's red light therapy, hyperbaric oxygen. You could go and take, get colonics. There's so many different these are all These are all, one, these are all complementary. Yeah, it, but it's overwhelming. It's like you can't do maybe more than a, a fraction of all the stuff well, that's available. I, let's, I, I remember let's, hearing... Let's, uh... Yeah. Uh, well, here's what I would say to that. I would say, let's simplify it a little, right? Because it seems overwhelming, but when you simplify it, you get down to, you get down to three things. You get down to hydrogen, oxygen, and the combination thereof, which is water. Cause that's what, the, that's what your body runs on fundamentally. Everything else is a downstream type of solution. These are all wonderful types of interventions, but when you, but when you, the things that you mentioned, hyperbaric, hyperbaric for one. What does that do? Well, it increases the amount of oxygen. Okay. What do all these, what do all these uh, metabolic interventions do? Like you mentioned, well, they increase the amount of energy in the electron transport chain. Increase the amount of protons, which is again goes back to hydrogen. So uh, all these things lead back to the most simplest thing, which is what, which is what we need at the most fundamental level for our biology oxygen, hydrogen, and the proper combination thereof, or the actual combination, which is H2O. So everything else is just kind of, it's kind of noise. It's kind of downstream. It's all, it's all kind of, you know, it's very nutritional, it's beneficial, but, but you look at the you scientifically kind of empirically look at what is the thing that, 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 uh, everything breaks down to, to produce fuel in our bodies. And when, and then that, and then that answer becomes quite, quite elegantly simple. So what uh, would you say is the uh, impact for somebody who takes uh, the deuterium depleted water over the course of, I don't know, say a few months to a year? Are they going to see noticeable uh, changes in their health, uh, their energy levels, uh, whatever, uh, you know, the, diseases they're they're facing do you expect that they might see some impact uh, on um, uh, disease uh, showing up in in their bodies like what what happens right in the short right. term of right. less than a so year? 
So unlike these other interventions that you mentioned, this is the complete opposite because you're not putting anything in your body. Actually, it's about reducing or taking something out, reducing the total burden of this isotope of hydrogen that we have. So when you reduce that, you increase metabolic energy, you increase the health of the mitochondria, not only the health of the mitochondria, but the, its ability to produce ATP. So what happens in the body when you increase the amount of net energy that you have? Well, many things can happen. So everybody's a little different, but generally I, I noticed that people, um, well, I'm not gonna talk about any of the medical type claims because people do use this as an adjuvant for, for different uh, illnesses that they go through to increase the amount of energy that they have. So their, so their own, so their own internal mechanism of self healing can, can kick in. But uh, one thing people notice is, uh, well, what happens when you increase mitochondrial health, your metabolism improves. So I noticed for myself, my metabolism went down to, uh, or sped up to the point where um, it's very much like I remember when I was a teenager, I could just eat tons of calories and, uh, and and everything would be assimilated. So recovery is faster, sleep is better. Um, it's just the optimization of, of your of your biology. People have people have uh, I, I remember early on we were trying to uh, quantify these things and some of, some of this has been quantified through studies. Uh, an amazing study showed that uh, that after 30 days of deuterium depletion, you need half the amount of oxygen to perform the same amount of work. And I see that as has, having incredible benefit for alpine climbers uh, to be able to summit like Mount Everest and some of these other tall mountains without supplemental oxygen. In fact, it's how the Sherpas do it. Not only are they acclimated, but their acclimation comes through drinking the water at base camp, which is 100, 126 or 28 ppm, which is very rare. So they're drinking a water that gives them it gives that makes their mitochondria work better, and when it mitochondria works better, you have a greater ability to utilize oxygen. So you'll find that things get lighter. That's what I notice. Just to say, as a, a kind of a, a general, non-quantifiable statement, more of a qualitative um, thing. It's like everything. That's why we call. It, I mean, we call it light water because not only is it lighter. Because if you put it on a scale with regular water, you will see that it is a little, I think 200, mi 200 micrograms less because of the deuterium is a heavier isotope. But everything, you just, you just feel lighter mentally, physically, everything just, you, 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 you feel like your aging process is slower, is slowing down. You're not going to, it's not going to stop, but it feels like it's going a bit slower because, because some of the things, some of those nagging things that we experience as we get older, just go away. And you go, okay, I'm, I feel the same as I did 20, 30 years ago. So that is the benefit of deuterium depletion. And that's why you see, uh, that's why we have long marveled at these people that are, that are uh, quite active into their nineties and even their hundreds. And even the oldest, uh, the oldest mother, I think is in her sixties, uh, natural birth wise, father, Wow. Since 90s and uh, these people live in these areas in these mountain areas where they're eating less and consuming and consuming water that is 15 to 20 percent lower in deuterium you see this with animals too so it's all throughout nature if you just start looking at it and uh it's a way to it's a way to take the little burden off of what our off of what our body's already doing and trying to filter out toxins and this is the number one natural toxin that we have. Like you said, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's been here with us since the beginning of time. So now when we evolved, we had less. So when we had less, we managed it better. We lived longer. Now we have more. So it's a little harder to manage. The diet, like I mentioned, also exacerbates that because we have a lot of, a lot of carbs, a lot of hydrogenated fats, a lot of things in our food that we don't know what they are because they're added ingredients, fortified, they call it. So, so uh, a natural lifestyle uh, in concert with uh, drinking water that being conscious of the deuterium level of your water is a great, it's just a, it's just a great foundational way of maintaining extreme health, extreme, yeah. extreme good health. 
very optimized health. And, and then some of these other biohacks become a little less important. So what's, what's your sugar intake? You, you personally, I'm, I'm guessing you're, you're drinking deuterium depleted water exclusively, I would guess. And, and I would imagine that you eat uh, pretty healthily and uh, reduce the amount of sugar and uh, processed foods that you're putting in your body. Could, could you give us a, uh, a, a picture of what you're definitely so your body I, on a daily so, basis? Yeah. So, you know, let, let's say somebody um, is on deuterium depleted water, but there's not the only liquid. Sorry, there's a mosquito I got to kill. <laughs> there's there uh you know like here i'm in the i'm in the tropics right now for for a couple of weeks i'm gonna have some coconut water right that's not deuterium depleted you know when i'm back home i'm gonna i like i like raw milk I'm gonna drink i drink a bunch of raw milk that i usually put in my tea that's not that's not deuterium depleted but if i drink deuterium depleted water at the end of the day i'll be putting in less deuterium in my body than what my body has. And so through the mechanism of hydrogen exchange, I will reduce a little bit of deuterium in my body. So same thing with same thing with, uh, with sugar or complex carbohydrates, you know, I, I try to, I try to, I try to limit it. But then I, I can, you know, the way I think about it is, I have this budget, right? It's like normally on a, on an average day, I would, I would say, Okay, I don't want to, I don't want to eat more than 30, 40 grams of of, of, uh, of carbs, you know, which includes sugar, which is a very, it's a kind of a keto, keto diet, but it's, you know, it's just how my lifestyle is. But then, but then that gives me a, it gives me this budget to do whatever I want <laughs> anytime I want. So I kind of, I keep very disciplined when I'm at home and then whenever I'm out, I don't even, don't even worry about it. It doesn't even phase me because I'm, everything is running really well. So whereas before, you know, if I eat something that doesn't agree with me in the morning, I would feel it. Now my metabolism is so good. Everything just burns up quite easily. I don't abuse it. And that's the key right there. It's just don't abuse that. When you have everything is working really well, know what your default is. And I know what my default is for the diet and the way I eat at home. But when I'm out and about or, you know, on uh, wanting to have a, have a it'll, it, what it does is it gives you, it gives you a, uh, gives you license and ability to, um, to go outside of that, uh, kind of strict, I would say, I would say strict lifestyle or chosen lifestyle. Cause it's not, it's not really self-imposed for any other reason than I love than, than I enjoy it and I enjoy the benefit of it. But, uh, but it's not, uh, something that, uh, I would say you have to follow religiously. In fact, many people that are on, that practice deuterium depleted lifestyle, they find that uh, they're able to do a lot, do a lot that, that that they would normally not be able to. Like, yeah. cool. Now, yeah. you you uh, started an organic uh, gourmet raw food restaurant, and that was prior to your discovery of the deuterium depleted water. Correct. years ago that was well here's a that was uh that was probably that was 10 years before and then and but that was 10 years before 2004 and then it took another from 2004 just knowing about it didn't didn't mean i had it right it took another we didn't start the company until uh 2019 actually end of 2018 but call it 2019 and 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 before that it took uh it, to build this, to build a factory, my colleagues to build a factory to do this took a t took twelve years. So this has been a long, a long journey. So it wasn't the factory didn't start getting built about twenty twelve, and, uh, and then it was you know ready for commercial production toward the toward twenty nineteen. So yeah, just because you know about something doesn't mean <laughs> doesn't mean you can do anything about it. In fact, there was there was a conference in nineteen seventy two on isotopes, deuterium, and all these scientists, they sat around the room and in 1972, and they said, and they said, well, we can see clearly that deuterium slows down biology, right? And, it, and because it's heavier than uh, regular hydrogen, it, it can misshape enzymes, it can misshape DNA, and uh, creates a whole bunch of biological processes uh, 
problems downstream and they all they all raise their hands you agree yes we all agree okay moving on next because there's nothing you could do about it so yeah, back in the back in that time early 2000s it would it would cost like uh, you know a thousand bucks for for a couple liters of deuterium depleted water because it's so hard to make i mean it's still hard to make it's just it's just you know as you as time moves on these processes you get more efficient you know, you've, you've, you've spend a lot of money developing it so now you have it but still it's really it's really very new and what the and what the novelty here is for the future of humanity is that what we have here is a new standard it's a new standard of water purity of water quality and it's a standard that ultimately people and everybody science and and society will realize is incredibly beneficial for our, for our health span. And this is why I'm so excited about it because this is such a, it seems like a, such a small intervention somebody could do, assuming that it's available for you. But let's say it was available. Let's say it was uh, a, a, a um, competitive, competitively priced. Then people would certainly consider it as a new standard of water purity. And all that is, is trying to match the standard that your body has already set within its intercellular matrix and its mitochondria. Mm. So this, the body's already given you a standard. It said, this is what, <laughs> this is what the water that I make is. So the water that you put in the body, you know, I can't use, I'll use it for something else, but I can't use it in the electron transport chain. I can't use it in the mitochondrial matrix. It's like, it's, I have to make the water from scratch. Like, like grandma used to make apple pie, <laughs> you know, two hydrogens and an oxygen. And it keeps the deuterium out of there because it's heavy, it's heavier. And so when we reduce this heavier contaminant from our, or we cannot, we cannot, we cannot completely eliminate it, but we can, we can do what we can to reduce it. And, and that's, and when it makes sense that when you see populations that live in these areas where they have slightly lower deuterium from their water, it, 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 it's no, it's no mystery anymore why they're healthier happier and longer lived. So can we bring this to everybody? That's my goal. It's just to bring this to everybody. And it's a big, it's a big mm -hmm. undertaking because it's a very difficult process. What you're doing is you're separating water from water. It's not like filtering a contaminant out of water. That's not water. This is actually HDO is water. It's just a heavier form of it. And then there's D2O, which rarely exists, but we know it we know it as heavy water because it's used in nuclear power plants and atomic bombs. In fact, we wouldn't have the atom we, we wouldn't have the atomic age that we're in if it wasn't for the discovery of deuterium. It changed the entire game of everything, knowing that hydrogen had three versions of itself. And we are only concerned with the second one, HDO. And we're, our main concern is to remove it, reduce it, eliminate it, get rid of it, because our body's biology and every, all the biology, every eukaryotic cell on the planet that uses oxygen does not, does not like it. it. It interferes and it interferes purely on a mechanical level. It's too big. Mm, yeah, makes sense. Okay, so I want to switch topics for the last few minutes here. Uh, but by the way, do you have, um, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes to, absolutely. to go over a little have, bit? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. So I would love to hear a bit more about um, your interest in gold. You have a book called Gold, Catalyst of Radiant Health. Gold yeah. isn't usually thought of as a catalyst for health. It's usually thought of as a as a store of value. Well, it's not in the. Bitcoin. There's no there's no USRDA for gold, right? But there should be. There really should be because it's another one of these trace elements that does things in our bodies that we that the that the it's not on the food pyramid. Yeah, yeah. So, USRDA uh, recommended daily uh, um, value of uh, amount to take. Yep. They, for, there's for no, nothing, so. nothing for gold out there. So same thing back in the early 2000s, I was, in, I got, I became interested in alchemy and uh, the history of alchemy and the word alchemy comes from alchemia, which means gold juice in Chinese, ancient Chinese. So gold is quite interesting um, in many, 
many respects. So I wrote a short book about it because I spent 10 years, more than 10 years in the lab trying to figure out how to reduce it because our bodies don't break down gold. Like you can't drink, you can't eat, you can't eat a little bit of gold and you expect your body to break it down to have any biological benefit because your the hydrochloric acid is not strong enough. Okay. You need nitric and hydrochloric, which is aquaregia, which are, which are stomach acids do not have. So you have to reduce it externally before you put it in the body. And so I was just reading all these things uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Indian literature, they call it, they have a, they have a medicine called Swarma Basma, and Ayurvedic and uh, Siddha medicine. And uh, of course, all the uh, uh, Middle Ages alchemical texts, the Egyptian alchemical texts, many different things have been written and and you always find something mentioned about gold and how people would eat gold but well, because knowing knowing chemistry you can't eat gold it won't do anything for you because it has no has no biological benefit but when you reduce it it's very different when you reduce it down to its what 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 is erroneously referred to as monatomic form and that's kind of a okay way to say it because it's because it truly is in a monatomic form but but not really so it, it, you reduce this. So gold is, gold has a, I don't know. Let's see, should we get into the chemistry of it? Cause that's where I like to go. I like to go, I like to go right into the, <laughs> right into the chemistry. Oh, we can, or we can, or we can. Hover. A little bit. Uh, little, I, I think bit. we, our, our listener might, um, yeah. Get so to, ima ima <laughs> over so, if we go too far. So gold. So, um, okay. So how do we, how do we get into this? So, gold is a metal right and metals like to bond with other metals okay and that's what gives them such a strong such a strong bond is they have strong uh, attraction to another atom of its of its of its own kind and that's because there's an electron hanging out in this case in the 13th orbital is valence electron and it, and it locks in with the other one that everything else has if you were to take that locking mechanism that allows it to lock with every other gold atom out there and you pulled it in pull it into a lower orbit. Now it doesn't have anything to bond with anything else. Now it's alone. That means monatomic. So then it goes into another, so then it goes into a higher spin state. It's like, a, it's like a uh, ice skater. When she tucks in, she goes faster, right? But we've all seen that. So when you tuck in, you, you and this is what's happening here. So it's a, so it's a, so you're creating, you're basically creating something that's different. You're changing the element. Actually, it's not the same element anymore. So, mm -hmm. and if you read the literature, that these types of what's known as monatomic elements, they're actually diatomic Cooper paired elements for anybody out there that wants to correct me on that. You don't have to, I just correct myself. But these, these monatomic elements, they're in a different state of matter than everything else. And this is what, this is what intrigued me and still intrigues me to this day and it would intrigue anybody once they start getting, get into this because, because they don't operate like the metal that they are in the macro state in the nano state, they operate very differently. And gold is a catalyst. That's why, that's why the name of the booklet is catalyst of radiant health. And, uh, when people ask me, well, how does this work? And I asked them, okay, can you explain to me? I'd say, I will explain to you exactly how it works if you have the time. And if you can explain to me how a car's catalytic converter works. And this is where everybody gets stumped. Because nobody can explain how a catalytic converter works. Because it works merely by presence, right? Something goes through something and it's changed without having any, con without having, without, just by having resonant contact, not having any physical contact with something. So... It's like when a, a bunch of guys are standing around in a room and then a beautiful woman walks in, what's the catalyst that she, what's the, what's the catalyzing reaction that she performs? Everybody starts going, oh, you know, <laughs> kind of just suck it in and go like, okay. So it's a catalyst reaction. So, it, so the, just, there's no contact, but the mere presence of this, of this gold atom changes things. So uh, this is a fascinating subject because this is because this go, this goes into spirit matter, and you know when when they when they weigh a person when they're dying on their deathbed and as soon as they die they lose twenty one grams right the weight just disappears where does it go and so 
So there's a lot of really good hypotheses on that, that, that a part of our bodies is made of this monatomic material, the spirit matter. And gold is one of those, um, is, gold is in that. And this is, and the different form of gold. And this is what they call alchemical gold. And this is why, this is why these alchemists were so keen on devote, devoting their entire lives to the study of this gold alchemy because they thought and they believed and maybe they were right, who knows, but they believed that it would not only extend, not only extend your uh, lifespan, but it also had some very important spiritual benefit. At the end, it's all about energy, like we, like we talked about from the beginning of this podcast, but this is a different, this is a different type of energy. Even, even uh, when we make this stuff in the lab, we notice that it, that, that, uh, four tenths of it, 40% of it disappears. Like the weight of it just goes away. It's like, where does it go? It's incredible. Like as it, as it, as it cures over 30 days and it's cured, we put it on a scale, right? And then there's no, it's like a magic trick, right? Nothing left, but somehow it got, somehow it lost weight. So that means that what happened there. So there's a lot of things that we can hypothesize on this. And this is, this is, this is quite fascinating. And, um, and I think that, that, you know, people need to get more involved in these types of, uh, esoteric, uh, scientific, uh, matters, because you just look at what people were interested in historically. And it's like, why would you be so, why, why would you be so interested in this? Well, there's a reason there's a, there's a reason. And, and, uh, so, these are more subtle. These are more subtle things to consider versus the, the gross physical nature of science today. And, uh, and there, there are some people that are quite into this, but I haven't met many. I haven't met, met many people that are into, and they're usually tend to be quite, quite secretive and hard to find people that are working on these type of alchemical, alchemical things. So it's not something that is, uh, is accepted in, in the mainstream, but when, but when you start studying what people are doing at this very advanced scientific level, they, they talk about it. They mention it because you can't explain it. It's something that's just like, it's just a, it's just one of these things that doesn't, doesn't quite, doesn't fit nicely into our understanding of the universe. Yeah. Now, uh, a very tangible example of this, it's hard to refute. I mean, this, you could, I guess, uh, say that it's it's a, a fake story or whatever. But there's this uh, a story online about a cat named Tut. <laughs> Do you know about this? With the, with the tail, I think something about the tail. No. Yes, the 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 tail uh, was. Oh yeah. uh, <laughs> right. I, I, I remember. Know, came off or was uh, somehow chopped off in an accident, and Tut regrew his tail by being treated with um, this liquid chi uh, monatomic uh, gold solution. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was really compelling. And I, I heard about this from, um, from, from uh, one of, one of the uh, angel team. So angel team healing, uh, Jerry Bedlington, <clears throat> He told me about Tut the cat <clears throat> and directed me to the page where all the uh, pictures of the cat regrowing his tail and uh, I, it's really impressive. Really, you know what's interesting uh, about that? Amazing. What is it, what's interesting about that is when, when we talk about monatomic elements and monatomic gold and other elements can be in that form too. But I have particularly focused on gold. Uh, it's a conductor. It's a conductor of energy. So uh, potentially it will unlock superconducting possibilities for us too. Room temperature superconductor, the holy grail of science. So when you when you think of the the body as a self healing organism, what is it missing? It's not missing the blueprint. It's missing the energy. So we actually are able to heal through regeneration, which is what this cat growing its tail back is. It's it's primarily we heal by scarring but we are able to heal by regeneration where in our fingertips right so if you cut the tip of your finger off it will re it will regrow and why when you look at somebody's when you look at the curalian photography of somebody for example you see an incredible amount of energy concentrated at the ends of at the at the tips of our fingers so so it has the energy to do it 
So if you just, if you just, if we just figure out a way, whether it's by accident or actual, or actual uh, trial and error, where we increase the amount of energy that we can have, that we can heal by regeneration. You know, in the, in the womb, I don't know up to what age in the, the embryo in the womb, but it, there is a, there is a, a certain time where if there's an injury that happens to a, um, uh, a, a fetus in the womb, that it will heal through regeneration. So this is, this is pretty, uh, pretty interesting stuff. I'm going to see if I can move because it's just got a little rain, rain coming here. <laughs> See if I can move under the. We're going to wrap up here in a second, anyways. Oh, go upstairs. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. <laughs> Get out of the rain here for a second. Okay, we're out, we're out of the rain. So, so yeah, I think that um, this is the stuff that's so really. So, do you just take been... uh, any kind of monatomic gold uh, as a supplement? Do you do you take liquid chi or anything like that? I take the stuff that I make myself, um, and uh, periodically, not all the time. But uh, yeah, I, I think my team is really the only one that's that I found that was able to quantify the amount of monatomic or high spin state gold in uh, solution because we go through a really rigorous process of making this stuff. And when we figured out the process over trial and error. Uh, and, and uh, just, just uh, <laughs> not giving up <laughs> over many years. Uh, and after that, I thought thought we had something, and we did. And then I started going back to these alchemical texts from the Middle Ages, and uh, sure enough, I could understand them now, because because I was because it was like reverse. It was like reverse uh, um, engineering because because there's a lot of there's a lot of like. You know the, the the language in such a way that you don't understand what it means. It's like it's like hidden, right? But once you have once you reverse engineer the process and you go back, you go, oh, okay, that's what they're doing. It's the same thing, and and uh, this is a uh, it's quite exciting that we're living in the age we are because back then they were doing this stuff back then successfully, and they didn't have any scales. They didn't know the good scales. They didn't know what the mole value of anything was. They didn't have the purity of chemicals that we have now. This stuff is just, it's a lot easier now. It's just a lot easier to do. And, uh, and still like my, my primary, primary interest, interest, uh, from 2006 was, uh, gold, but still, still hopeful to get into understanding the monatomics of, uh, rhodium, iridium. And uh, copper is a very interesting one because copper is uh, instead of that instead of that orbital being pulled in, it get, gets pushed out, which gives it levitating properties. So there's all kinds of things in nature that we just don't just uh, you know we, we there's if there's something that's a mystery, I, I tend to want to understand the fundamental um, science behind that. What makes it a mystery? Because I don't think anything really breaks these laws of physics that we know it's just it just it just informs us that there's more for us that there's things that we just don't understand that that still that still fit our rather basic understanding but but uh, but our, but um will expand our horizons uh, in um in the future uh, and you know i don't know that it took it took uh 60 plus years for to get to the point where people are starting to just barely understand what the, the 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 detriment of deuterium and the benefits of reducing it, and still, I mean, it, it's it's uh, you know it was discovered in the late late fifties. Um, scientists knew that it has that it had that incredible biological benefit to reduce it by the sixties, and here we are in twenty twenty something, and it's still just about every person with a PhD has never even heard the word. So these things take. Everything takes a long, long time, and uh, so I, I feel hey, we live in this. We live in this information age now. So I'm very, very grateful to be able to share this information on your podcast and other, and get people to start reading about it, thinking about it, uh, learning about it, and um, and seeing how this can 
make a benefit in their lives like it's made in everybody that's that's uh adapted it into their lifestyle yeah so. awesome now <clears throat> now where do, where do our uh listeners go to to get the light water uh deuterium depleted water and also where uh, would you recommend they get the uh, monatomic gold uh, do you actually sell what you make or uh is is there some other uh, option for them? If I don't I don't sell it right now. Uh, used to in the past, but right now I don't. And I think I think it, it has to do with uh, well, I just don't have the time to make it. <laughs> that's really the, that's really the problem. <laughs> yeah, but because uh, it takes right. time. So would takes, you recommend like, liquid chi as a as an? Alternative I don't know. I don't know what I've never tested it. What I normally do is I is here's here's my here's my there's a litmus test that I that I go through when someone says they have something of a monatomic nature or high spin state matter. And uh, most things aren't because anything that's in a high spin state will not do well with anything that isn't like, it's very easy to, it's, 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 it's a, uh, it's very volatile. Like it, it'll go, it'll go back to a, a metal very easily, very quickly because it's not a natural state for it to be in this superconducting state. So the, how we're able to put it into that state is by re, is re, is removing all energies because those bonds are very strong bonds. So you have to you have to reduce all you have to remove all the energy in the system to in order for those bonds to be released. Simple explanation. So when I see anything that is complexed with anything else, like if I were to put monatomic gold in with anything else, it would fall out of mon, being monatomic because of that energy would 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 have an impact on on that and once there's once there's energy those that 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 the magic of that of that orbital being pulled in now gets forced back out and it becomes a metal again so anything that has a ph that isn't neutral anything that has is complex with something other uh, whether it's other metals other minerals elements whatever it is vitamins sugars anything of anything that has a has an ionic activity essentially right so in order for this to exist it has to be in a non-ionic form so no with no ionic activity and it has to it wants to be alone it does not want to be with anything else because that will force it to go out of monatomic state so that's my first litmus test before i even get it into the lab and try to and try to see if it has any monatomic in it so that's why that's why i don't recommend anything that that I, well, it's not that I don't recommend it. It's just that I, I challenge, I challenge whether it is monatomic or not, and it usually isn't, because it cannot. It does not just just from experience, and you will find as you get it deeper into uh, alchemy, you'll find that these things do not. They they like to be left alone. So if something, so if you're buying something that says monatomic, and they and they say, well, we like to. And here's another one, made under the full moon. Okay. That's ridiculous because you need because you need you need the new moon to make monatomics. You need you need no energy. In fact, when we do it, the moon has to be behind either either we're underground or the moon is behind the earth. Because again, any energy will cause you to have ca cause your reaction to potentially fail or be a, or or not be as good a reaction to get a monatomic element out of it. So you have to reduce all energy in order. It's like a it's like a it's like a meditating monk, right? In order to find stillness, you have to release. You have to release all the thoughts in your body. In order, to, same thing. You have to release all those, all those bonds, the chemical bonds, in order for something to go into that special state yeah. of matter. So, I don't know this product that you mentioned, but but that's my litmus test for whether something is monatomic or not. Got and it. okay and so in where, terms, where do we yeah. get the, the light water from <laughs> light light water is from drink light water d-r-i-n-k and then l-i-t-e-w-a-t-e-r drinklightwater.com that's our website we also have a second website called deuterium test and you can you can if you can go to the main site and that'll take you there too but what well, deuterium test is a lab that we set up that we could actually measure a person's deuterium in their body so they know that they know that this is working for them. It's a, it's a, it's a, you have to be committed to this intervention. Like you mentioned, it is expensive. So you want to know that it's doing something for you. And that's why we have the, we do a test 
can measure saliva, other body fluids, water, regular water. We can tell you what the deuterium content of that is. Also, if you want to, right. anybody interested in more in-depth uh, knowledge in terms of study or the science, there's also deuteriumdepletion.org. Uh, and we have a summit that we do. We're getting ready to do our second online summit called Deuterium Depletion Summit, where we have the world's leading scientists and thinkers in this space, in the deuteronomic space. So this is a, a, this is a nascent uh, branch of biochemistry. So it's very exciting for anybody that's uh, interested in these types of, uh, not only the science of it, but the benefit as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you have a discount code for, for our listener? I think we do, but uh, unfortunately, I think my marketing person was supposed to get you that. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll put that in the show notes Yeah. for uh, our listener to go to the website of uh, getyourselfoptimized.com and check uh, the show notes for that discount code. Yeah, there's a, you do get a discount if you become, if you become a subscriber. And I would say to everybody is learn the information first understand what the benefits are, what the long-term benefits are, because once you start this in order to, in order for it to work, you don't want to stop. You want to maintain this. You, you certainly want to do it for the first three to four months before you even test yourself. Obviously you can test yourself to get a baseline before, but that you can, you can arrive at that very easily without spending the money to test yourself and know what your baseline levels are. But the key is to get educated and to learn what this is going to do for you. So you can be excited on the follow through because you're going to be doing this for a while before you start seeing uh, the benefit. Some people see the benefit right away, but really it's a long term. It's a, it's, you know, the older we are, I think the quicker we see the benefit because your body isn't expecting for its deuterium levels to drop. It kind of, it's kind of a, it's kind of a pleasant shock, a pleasant surprise because as we get older, we just, we just accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. So when our deuterium levels go down, it's a pleasant, it's a pleasant thing that happens. So as you get older, it's, it's, it's better. But uh, like I said, what, what I'm interested in is is uh, human performance. So as time goes on, we'll see if the reduction of deuterium actually, you know, can we break that three minute mile by increasing the amount of, uh, of um, ATP in the mitochondria? We'll see. I don't know yet. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you for... Uh... Uh, such an informative and inspiring episode and uh, for doing what you do in the world to help people's uh, health and longevity. So, and thank, thank you, you listener. So uh, thank you so much. We will uh, catch you on the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs>